Well, good evening and welcome to the episode three of the Maternity and Midwifery Hour. And this will be supporting pregnant new mothers, pregnant women, new mothers and families. Sorry, I got that a little wrong. And, and I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted that I have I have three guests all together. Two guests. One is the head of midwifery, Sarah Noble, and a consultant midwife, Abby Holmes. And also we'll have Kate Morse a little bit later. And just to start things off, I just perhaps like to ask Sarah if you have a moment of the week to share with um, our audience. Oh, Sue, yes. Um, I think I've got two, actually. Um, my, my first one, I'm a, such a big fan of uh, Captain Tom. And uh, just uh, earlier on today, I was listening to You'll Never Walk Alone um, with him singing to Michael Ball. Um, so he's just my hero. You know, he's raised over five million for the NHS. I think he's marvellous. Um, so I think that was my moment. And I did have a moment when I was listening to him singing. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> And then the second one was, you know, we've had a fantastic week. Um, so we've had four home births in the last five, wow. which has just been amazing. Fantastic, fantastic. Those are two fab moments of the week. <laughs> How about Abby? Um, mine would be, um, uh, I, we'll talk about it with you a little later, but we have the opportunity to, to get some wonderful feedback from our ladies. And we're getting such wonderful positive birth stories coming out from our ladies and we had some really joyful moments of our home birth rate like Sarah just said is really escalating now so we're getting some wonderful stories back and also seeing um, in the service that I work for really seeing this week a lot of our virtual services come into fruition has been really exciting for me it's really really good week so far. Fabulous thank you that was a really good start to the session and thank you for that. I'm going to go on to this now. And I should have said, my name's Sue McDonald and I'm chairing this evening. I always forget that bit. Uh, and this is our midwifery hour that we welcome you to. Okay. And just to say that this um, has been brought to you by the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. And the aim of the session is really to provide information and support to midwives, student midwives, and all of those who are support, and, and there are many who are supporting women, babies and families at the moment. And this mid Maternity and Midwifery Hour and the podcast, which will also be available on iTunes, Spotify and all podcast players, is also supported by Matflix, which is video streaming from Maternity Experts. And that's a, a, a resource that I'm sure a lot of viewers will know about because this is the way of having your CPD made, needs made easy. So if you need uh, your, to get your revalidation done or have a student project to complete, Matflix is a, a one-stop shop for you and really fantastic resource. Okay, and I'm just going to um, pop out a little bit of news. Um, some of this is a little bit hot off the press. Um, we have this uh, new OBS COVID resource, which has come out uh, today. And this is a way of really recording. What you have to do is record if you have been in contact with someone with COVID, a mum with COVID, and then you put in your uh, details and then you keep a track of your symptoms. Uh, and it's a way of mapping um, what's happening with you and with with the mother you do have to just register yourself and this is an opportunity for me to say that uh, after this um, streaming we have a whole list of resources and this is um, attached to that it's, it's, it's right at the bottom it's very new so you can have a look at that after the um, presentation there's also several um, guidelines from the Royal College of Midwives on antenatal care, which are very relevant to us at the moment, uh, and those have just come out this week. And also something a bit creative for your creative, our creative midwives and students and viewers is the Midwife Patchwork 2020. Um, and for this is a real creative thing for us to think about celebrating this year which is the, the year of the nurse and the year of the midwife. And again, this is on our list of resources, so you can access this after the presentation. I think it's important that we do remember that we started this year on a real high, 
as the year of the nurse and midwife and it was a very happy time and it's kind of sometimes it's um, difficult to remember that except when I've just heard Sarah and Abby just talking about their joyful moments this evening it's kind of recapturing the bit that we have as midwives and, and that feels very nice indeed because it, it makes you feel even though things are very difficult there's some good stuff going on so those tweeters amongst you our twitter tag, tag is the midwifery hour and our twitter account is midwifery forum and i'd like to also kind of spend a few moments just thinking about the people who are within the service and also supporting the service and supporting all of us in, in the whole society at the moment, all the, the bin men, the Royal Mail, cleaners, emergency services, teachers, carers, and the, all the key workers, as well as our wonderful, wonderful NHS. We obviously have a very special part in our hearts for the NHS, but there's an awful lot of us there to support. Um, and we do remember the Thursday clapping activity for all of us, which is a small way of all of us thanking all of us which has been very positive it's been though it's a very difficult time what's struck me and I suppose is my special moment is the positiveness that the public have towards midwives which they always have had but it's even more explicit and also to people in the NHS and I hope we, that's something that we can retain I think what's very sad um, and again I'd like to record this we've lost a lot of people in the health service and it's that's really very difficult for many people many people will know someone and will have lost someone they know or they've been in contact with we were talking a little bit earlier Sarah and uh, Abby and I about midwifery and the world of midwifery being very small so it's almost it makes it more hard when you lose someone and I'd like to just uh, just place on comment now our losses over the last couple of weeks have been two midwives and a maternity care support worker at the moment and that's midwife Lindsay Coventry who worked at Harlow and midwife Linda Clark who worked at the Royal Albert Edward Infirmary and then Joan Snickersgill at who's an MCA at St James and, and I've put them kind of one each corner and one in the center the one in the center is Lindsay Coventry and I think we have to maybe spend some time thinking about the people we have lost and valuing what we've lost from them there's been a lot in in the health service a lot of things have been closed down and um, well the world has almost feels it as though it's been closed down to a certain extent and um, I know elective surgery has been uh, slowed down everything in mid maternity, it's kind of different. Um, we have this the additional stress, we have the anxiety, we have some staff who are sick, and some staff who are shielding their, their uh, family. And we also obviously have staffing issues, which I'm sure Sarah and Abby are going to talk about. Um, and there has been a need to amend the services to make sure women feel they're safe, and also midwives feel safe at, at providing that care. Because most importantly, maternity services can't be cancelled, they can't be delayed. Antenatal and postnatal care still needs to be delivered. And babies still are born and mothers and, and families still need support. And we need to be there to provide that support. So I think at that point, it's a quite a good time to move on to our to really look at some of the issues around um, the maternity services. And so tonight we're going to be looking at what's happening in the maternity services and the impact of COVID-19 and what innovations heads of service are using to support women and babies and families and also how the quality of care and all the things that we've worked really hard for like continuity of care and home birth, how they're being looked after at the moment and I think some viewers are going to find this very interesting. Firstly, I'm delighted to introduce Sarah Noble who is a head of midwifery in South Warwickshire NHS Foundation Trust. She was on the National Maternity Review so she knows 
about that very well, and she contributed to the publication of the Better Births Report. She advises on several national groups, including the Maternity Transformation Stakeholder Council and the Continuity of Carer Subgroup, and she's a national clinical midwifery lead for Workstream 3, Choice and Personalization. She's also, and she'd probably be very modest about this, but she's also a Florence Nightingale Scholar and RCM Fellow. And I'm really delighted you're here with us tonight, Sarah. Oh, so thank you, Sarah. The Sue. floor thank is you. yours. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as you say, we just wanted to share um, our experience, really, and the preparation and the build-up um, to um, the pandemic. Um, so just a little bit about, you know, um, us and where we work. So we're based in South Warwickshire, um, a sort of medium-sized unit, just over 3,200 3, uh, births. And um, as Sue says, we've done a huge amount of work, you know, with the team around maternity transformation. So we're in a good starting position in as much as we've got a system-wide approach to continuity of care. So all our in-area women are on a continuity of care pathway. And in March, we reported that we we're achieving 39% um, throughout, um, throughout the pathway. Um, and, uh, you know, absolute avid believer that that relational co uh, care is so, so important and it really has been taken to a different level, I think, during this pandemic, you know, when women's anxiety levels are even higher than they would ordinarily uh, be. Um, and the fact that, you know, it is established here has been so beneficial um, that women have had that really close relationship you know with their named midwife uh, supported by the wider team. So we've got just under 40% of our total workforce working out in the community um, and that remains the same today. They are still sort of working there and the ethos is very much around following women wherever uh, they birth. Um, so good, good teams. And I think uh, I'm so proud uh, to be a midwife and so proud to lead this team because they really are, I, I believe, the best of the best and committed to um, delivering safe and personalised care. So at the beginning, of course, you know, part of my role as head of midwifery is that you have to plan for the worst case scenario. And in that, you know, we sort of sat down together, social distancing, <laughs> to talk about the business continuity plan and really, you know, think in a completely different way if staffing levels were to drop, um, you know, and if you're at a critical point, you've actually only got 25% of your overall workforce that are available to work. Um, so it's thinking about, you know, what is the critical function of maternity services? And of course, that is provide one-to-one -one care in labour and through the business continuity, it's really working back from that red point, that red zone, as to which services would go at what point and why. And of course, you know, in maternity, it's not just based on the number of midwives that you've got, but we've got so many interdependencies with other services like sonographers and paediatricians and anaesthetists and obstetricians that that all, you know, really needs to feed into the business continuity as to what services you can deliver at any one time. But as we were working through this together, um, you know, when we sort of first drafted it, you know, there was a sort of tendency where we need to pull everything to centre. And then we well, no, this is this is crazy. Actually, we've just said the critical core function is providing one to one care in labour. But that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the labour ward. You know, that one to one care in labour, it's still really important as to where, you know, the woman wants to birth, whether that's at home or in the birth centre. So right from the beginning in the continuity plan, you know, there was that sort of commitment um, to continuing to support that one to one care in labour as the critical core function, irrespective of whether, where that was. Um, and again, if anybody's you know, interested in, you know, more than happy to share that as a resource. Um, so 
it, it was very much about sort of looking at how we make decisions. Um, it's, we've been very sort of lucky here. We haven't seen uh, a surge. Um, we've had the prevalence is, uh, has been very low and we've been able to maintain our services in the green so far all the way through this pandemic. Um, but we feel, you know, should there be a surge, you know, we are very well prepared. Uh, we've got a very clear structured decision making process, um, which is sort of MDT uh, led and various um, written a whole paper on it in terms of, you know, how decisions are made, who needs to be involved in any one decision and where that decision needs to go. And I think that is really important in terms of, you know, keeping a service safe um, that, you know, if we needed to, um, account for why a service um, was uh, stopped or reduced, you know, we would have a very clear narrative and a process to be able to explain that and also evidence of an ongoing sort of, you know, audit trail that we could reassess it um, to reinstate it as quickly as possible. Um, but the main uh, thing that really wanted to talk about um, was home births. So, as we were doing the business continuity plan, you know, our starting point at South Warwickshire for home births was very low, 0.46% last year. Um, in 2018, we opened our alongside birth centre, um, which uh, approximately just over 18% of all our births go through the birth centre. I was really pleased to see early on that was an endorsement from um, the International Confederation of Midwives saying, actually, you know, why not consider sort of home birth, you know, not only because we know the evidence from birthplace that it's safe and the uh, series in The Lancet uh, more recently about the safety of home birth, but actually during, during a pandemic where our high risk, more vulnerable women have been told by the government to self-isolate, uh, you know, why bring them in if they don't need to be brought in because there's a medical indication. If they're low risk um, and everything is straightforward, you know, why not, you know, promote uh, the choice of home birth? Um, so that's what we've done. You know, we are, have continued to offer all three choices around place of birth, you know, which is the norm for us. So that's home birth, the birth center and hospital birth. Um, and, it, and it's really, really early days. You know, it's only sort of been three weeks, really. And that's the time sort of getting um, the decision through all the various um, decision making uh, processes it needed to go through. Uh, we only sort of really actively promoted this through our social media last week to women. But we have seen such an incredible growth. Um, we've had five home births in the last, um, what was it, four home births in the last five days. That's it. Um, and have over sort of 14 uh, women booked still for um, April and numerous women, we can see it sort of increasing really quickly for May. Um, so that for us, in terms of the size of our unit, it's about 50% of all our activity will be birthing at home that would have ordinarily birthed in the um, MLU. One of the things, um, which really needed to think about, you know, in terms of, you know, it's sort of a risk around this um, and worked in partnership with the West Midlands Ambulance Service was that if we were actively promoting home birth and it took off, which I felt it would and, you know, it has, that extra sort of increase in demand on service, um, perhaps from transfer from home into hospital would impact the ambulance service. So we worked and involved them very early on um, in the discussions to be assured um, that they would um, be able to support um, those transfers because that obviously is critical in, in maintaining a same home birth service. And, um, and we did some modelling together and they were very confident uh, that they could. Um, but one of the things I pulled together was a standard operating procedure to actually think how we could alleviate some of the pressure um, for transfers. Um, so I've just sort of share, um, it's rather a busy slide, I apologise, go back a minute just so you're not distracted by that. Um, I suppose my background, I've had two home births myself, uh, two of my 
three children were born at home and uh, set up a head dedicated home birth service in Birmingham. So I'm a very experienced home birth uh, midwife myself. And I think through my own personal experience of being at numerous home births, I often thought, you know, when you did need to transfer in, that the vast majority of your transfers in were for non-emergency or life critical reasons. They were often um, uh, because labor had slowed down or you wanted um, to offer continual monitoring or the there was sort of um, thick uh, meconium. Very few, probably two to three percent of all emergencies were your really, you know, <laughs> moments where, um, you know, life critical that you needed to get in quickly. And, you know, at the numerous home births I've been, you know, routinely two ambulances are sent, you know, even though that you've only requested one because the mother is hemorrhaging, baby's actually been born and um, okay. Um, so I was speaking to West Midlands Ambulance Service and whilst this is our local SOP, we sort of put together, you know, I should have done it in red, amber, green, but um, your level one are your life critical emergencies, which of course you would call an ambulance or and your level two but if you look at the level three um ordinarily culturally you know we would call an ambulance and, and i've certainly called an ambulance before for level three emergencies but actually for for these um you know women could use i'm not expecting women to drive themselves in but you know a partner to drive um you know, a woman or a family member to drive a woman into hospital because you've got time. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's the assessment, that's the risk assessment that you've got to take is, you know, whether you've got the time. Um, obviously, the midwife would still phone ahead and you would still have those you know, normal communications with your labour ward lead um, to relay why you're transferring somebody in. Um, so that's what we sort of put together um, and agreed. Um, with the view and it's so early days but we will sort of monitor it um, but it should reduce um, you know some pressure on the ambulance service and actually be a much nicer experience for women um, less frightening less stressful and, and quicker you know when you're just going in your own car um, and meet the midwife um, at the hospital. Uh, so the other things that we've done, I think one of the critical things, you know, in in particularly in a pandemic, but anyway, are really good communications. Um, and our first level of communication, which we have embedded, of course, is that name midwife. And we've said to all of our midwives to really up their communications. So the midwives are more regularly phoning women, just doing those check-ins, you know, in addition to their antenatal uh, checks and in addition to their routine postnatal visits. Um, there are more sort of check-ins uh, with women. Uh, I think it was, I can't remember, about two weeks ago, the weeks are blurring now, uh, we launched our Facebook page, particularly for the pandemic, um, and we've already got over 1,600 uh, followers. And we've had a huge amount of positive feedback um, because things are changing on a daily basis, how you access the unit, how you're going to be greeted in terms of what PPE you can expect midwives to be wearing, um, what can you expect for your uh, appointments, are they going to be virtual, are they going to be face-to-face. -face? Um, so this has been a really good uh, medium for us to um, post uh, daily um, sort of updates um, out to women. Um, and if anybody wants to have a look at the sort of things, that's, our, that's the link uh, there. Um, and, and, it, and it's open. We've opened it to um, mothers and, uh, and family members. Um, one of the other, we were doing a pilot before the pandemic started with uh, the University of Salford, uh, Face Mums. So we've got six pilot groups of cohorts of 20 women that have two midwives um, within their group. So the midwives and the women have never met face to face, but it's that virtual support um, through social media. Thank you. Um, that's just my timing, um, which has been fantastic. And it's another layer on a very personal level, because often when I'm sort of uh, posting, it's uh, it's at the end of a end of the day, sort of at nine, ten o'clock at night. But it, it's a much more personal conversation that you're having. 
Um, we've worked very closely with the Maternity Voice Partnerships and any sort of decisions we've made, we have, you know, involved, um, involved them as well. Um, I've just got some resources here. So this is this is quite a long leaflet that we've got. I think it's about 30, 30 pages. Um, it's just the front two pages of it. Um, but it goes through the whole pregnancy uh, and birth pathway for women. And this has been really useful, again, for sort of our primary care partners. Um, so they know. Uh, you know what to expect and can inform women. Um, you can go back and look at these, but I think, uh, like Abigail was saying earlier, you know, my inbox has been flooded with some really positive um, comments. It's really been noticeable over the last three weeks, which has been wonderful because quite often, sometimes as head of midwifery, you only hear the not so positive stories. So it, it's been a real, uh, a real change. So I hope that continues. One of the things I think that made us a success is, you know, as well as really looking after our women, we've got to really look after our staff. And, and that's something that we, you know, really invest in because, you know, people, our people are our beating heart. And if we don't get that right, you know, we won't get it right for families either. Um, and there's sort of a whole list of things, you know, that we are doing to support and promote um, staff uh, well-being. So, I think that was that was the last slide. Okay, that's fabulous. I was I was transfixed by the chocolate. Yes. <laughs> I think I love I love the idea of the free wellbeing coaching and apps, and I think that's one of the things the NHS has been very busy at, at producing other things that support staff as well as as chocolate. But I'm liking the chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. That was a really excellent session. And I think it'll be interesting to see how Abby's session might, there might be some dovetailing, I think. So I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker, who is known, I'm sure, by a lot of people, our consultant midwife who's at Cardiff and Vale University Health Board, Abigail Holmes, or Abby. Um, her role focuses on normality and providing support and guidance for women and families, including uh, birth choice clinics and afterthoughts services, among a lot of other roles. I know she's very passionate about her role within normality and supporting women. So the floor is yours now, Abigail. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sue. Thank you for having me. Um, I was just going to take you through what we at Cardiff and Vale Maternity Services have been doing in response to the um, COVID-19 pandemic. And I was going to break it into the um, four aspects of the services. So we've got our antenatal services, our intrapartum care, postnatal care, and then the support that we've been able to intertwine with all of that, um, with using our antenatal education and the resources that we've made available to our ladies and their families. So if I start with make the screen there we are um uh oh it's gone too far oh with our antenatal services so um the first thing that we did was when um our gp surgeries were beginning to um close and our access was becoming a little restricted for our women to reach to our midwives initially for that um that first referral when they first find out that they're pregnant we needed to come up with a quick solution for how we could still make sure that these ladies could access our services. So we set up a virtual booking system where the ladies would um, contact us via email to tell us that they were pregnant and that would generate the booking forms to go out to them all electronically so they could very comfortably from their own home complete their initial booking assessment, send them in and then the midwives within their teams would then contact them and then have their booking appointment done virtually. What's been really exciting about that system is that usually these systems take months of planning of how we're going to, um, what you know, obviously our information governance, what kind of um, processes, we map pathways, we meet about these things. And in this situation, we discussed it on the Monday and had it up and running by the Friday, which was really exciting mm -hmm. to see the service kind of um, be rolled out so quickly and we communicated it to all of our GP surgeries across Cardiff and Vale and the uptake has been really really phenomenal and all of our referrals are coming through electronically now all of our community midwives have access to the system 
we have a grading system so that we can clearly see when a booking has been actioned. So um, it seems to be working really well and the women are really speaking positively of it. We've moved a number of our antenatal appointments, particularly the 16-week appointment and the 25-week appointment to virtual um, clinic appointments with their named community midwife. And we also offer um, a healthy pregnancy clinic, which is for our ladies um, who have a BMI of 35 or above, um, and that's to support them to be healthy during their pregnancy. So we've moved some of those services into a virtual service as well, um, depending on whether it's coupled with a, a growth scan or not. And our birth choices clinics has moved um, onto an online platform. That can be a number of different medias. Um, the majority of ladies have some form of access, either a simple telephone call, or it could be um, Facebook Messenger, uh, FaceTime, WhatsApp video, or the newly rolled out Talk Anywhere app, which has been rolled out across the NHS in Wales. Again, that started off in primary care, and has been moved into secondary care, which again has been really successful. We know that a number of our women were feeling really very anxious about coming to the hospitals, so which I'll talk about a little bit later, but we did then do a virtual tour for the ladies so they could see that the process that they would walk through when they came into the hospital, to reassure them about um, the precautions that we were taking, the way that we were setting up social distancing within our antenatal waiting areas, and what the um, staff would be wearing. Sarah did touch upon it, but showing them the PPE that the, mid the midwives would be wearing when they were greeted. Um, a number of ladies actually find it really reassuring to know that the midwives will be wearing their PPE. So that was quite good. Um, and we then we've moved across from recommendations of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology onto the slightly altered method of testing for gestational diabetes so that the women aren't sat for long periods of time within the waiting areas. And we have asked that um, our ladies attend as not many appointments as they can, if not all appointments on their own. As the ladies uh, are coming into the areas, they have a screening, which would be um, a simple history check for symptoms and also having their temperatures taken. We've moved a number of our safeguarding case, conference, case conferences and core groups onto virtual technologies, which is really um, embrace multidisciplinary working um, and able to facilitate good working relationships whilst we're not all able to be in the same room. And what, as well as Sarah noticed, is this huge increase in the uptake of home births, which as a consultant midwife for normality has been just wonderful because, you know, we, we talk about home births all the time and we try to um, encourage home births as much as we can, um, but our rates did remain still low similar to Sarah's below that 1%, and suddenly we're seeing this huge increase. And But what we had, we needed to do was make sure that this decision was made safely. It's always the mother's choice to birth her baby wherever she may choose to. But we wanted to just put those extra processes in for ladies to really have that opportunity to really explore their decisions that they were making. So I offer now a virtual home birth assessment. Now, if a lady had planned to have her baby at home from the onset of her pregnancy, then um, it's normally a brief conversation. If a lady's option for place of birth has changed in light of COVID, we just explore that a little more to make sure that what their choices are. I do a virtual assessment of the home environment and that's not to kind of assess someone's home as you know, suitable for home birth, but look at the logistics, um, getting to a property, getting access to a property in and out, which normally the midwife would do at their home assessment, which is not what we're not offering at the moment but we do it virtually and I've had some wonderful guided tours with uh, webcams around homes and things so that's worked really well and there's a there's a group of us that are doing those assessments um, and in for April I compared the data to last year as you can see on my screen in April 2019 we had four planned home births and for this April we have 26 which takes us from one percent to six percent which is um which is huge We've also amended some other local policies and our anemia guideline, and we've um, upped our threshold or lowered our threshold, should I say, for um, offering women treatment with iron, looking at the way um, Italy responded and their um, depletion of blood stores within their blood banks. We've now moved our iron levels to 120 and um, anyone below that, we would offer them some iron therapy just to minimise that chance of those ladies needing blood products if we were to have um, any concerns about blood products within Wales. 
So then when we move into our interpartum care, we had um, a, a very thriving midwifery-led unit within the University Hospital Wales, and a number of the units within Wales have um, these units. When we looked at the way that we were able to deliver our service and the areas that we would be able to offer um, care to our ladies that were either suspected or confirmed of having COVID, the decision was made from the health board to centralise our services onto the um, obstetric unit and um, offer midwifery-led care within the obstetric service. So it did mean that we had to reduce the number of pools that were able, we were able to offer our ladies. We went from five pools to one. However, with a number of the MLU women now opting to birth their babies at home, that balance still, still seems to um, be, be manageable. What we have noticed is since re-amalgamating the set services that we separated almost out maybe 12, 13 years ago, if not longer than that, when we established our MLUs, has been the staff coming together and seeing this really multidisciplinary working really at its absolute forefront and the promotion of normality throughout the delivery suite, not just in the midwifery-led units and seeing um, the midwives, the obstetricians, anaesthetists, and everyone kind of working together. It's been a real marvel to see, and you'll see some of the feedback that the women have been giving us. We've restricted to one birth partner, which I think is probably quite universal now for most maternity units, and that's for the duration of the birth or planned cesarean section. And for a short duration afterwards, and we aren't able to accommodate visitors on our antenatal or postnatal mm -hmm. wards. And that has seen, again, um, the unintended um, outcomes of these things is seeing the women engaging with each other. It's not often you go into a bay now where the curtains are drawn in a four bedded bay. The women are sat breastfeeding their babies or feeding their babies and engaging with each other, which is something that many of us remember from when we had the dining room or dining tables in our bays and seeing the women. Um, developing almost lifelong friendships with each other, which has been really lovely to see. Then when we look to our postnatal services, we offer um, my kind of my other half at work is um, consultant midwife of public health. And she is um, responsible for our postnatal contraceptive service that we offer all of our ladies. And she now does our daily ward round. And so all of our ladies are discharged home with with the method of contraception of their choice whether that's a coil implant um, um, depot or, or one of the pills. Um, so that's been really useful as well to help those ladies. So when they go home, it's not something else that they've got to consider about that trip to the GP. So that's been really um, well evaluated by the staff and the women. When our ladies go home, their first day assessment, every lady is contacted on their first day with a virtual assessment and those essential visits are still carried out. So if there's any safeguarding concerns or any women that has felt to be in need, they will still have their first face-to-face -face visit with a midwife. If not, it will be virtual. We were very kindly donated um, many virtual devices from a number of companies across Cardiff, so that we now are able to offer um, all of our community teams and specialist teams have the devices that they can contact the women and um, see the babies at home. So if there was a concern about, concern about jaundice or anything like that, then we could, um, view those babies at home. One of the big things that we set up in Cardiff was the all way, well to start with the Cardiff and Vale Antenatal Education and Support Group but we noticed very quickly women from other health boards were, were wanting to join. We opened that out to all of our seven health boards and it's now got over coming up to three and a half thousand women and their partners and their families as members of the group um, and in that we've got professional and peer support and bite-side information so the ladies can go on and get snippets of antenatal education broken down into um, small sections. They've got breastfeeding support, antenatal exercise. They've got yoga classes on there, hypnobirthing, birth choice sessions. So it's been such a valuable group for the ladies that they've really, really um, been really positive about. And what we've also added is professional videos. So we have um, uh, one of our anaesthetic co colleagues giving us an update of the analgesia services that are available for women with or without COVID. We had our home birth service updates, which I, I delivered. Um, we've got antenatal services. We did notice that ladies were choosing not to come to their appointments. We really wanted to strengthen the message. We'd like them to continue to come if at all possible. Um, we did our tours of the unit so that women could see where they would be coming to give them that reassurance. And we tried to do these weekly to keep the ladies up to date. Um, they're also for the staff as well, because 
it's really important that when we're thinking about the home birth provision that we're keeping our women safe, but we're also making sure our midwives are working in that comfortable environment. So we are asking our ladies to kind of respect the one birth partner rule and, and just work with us so that we can keep the midwives feeling safe and comfortable working in the ladies' home and also promoting this wonderful service that would be such a loss if we had to think about cancelling a home birth service or withdrawal of service. But um, so far, the majority of our health boards have managed to keep them going. And then just finally, to show you some of the feedback from our ladies. And these are the stories that tell us that the women are having, um, in the light of everything that's going on, the anxiety that they were feeling before they came in to have their babies, not being able to have their partners for them in those first few days after the baby's born, but actually how they're finding things. Are they just, one, it, just wonderful experiences that they're having? We've, we have had some, um, the first one you can see there from Hannah, these ladies who gave me permission to share these with you who um, had a very quick birth outside of the hospital she didn't quite make it into the building um but the midwives were there ready and waiting for her um about the friendships they delivered with the other mid other women um and just feeling that the staff would be going above and beyond now we know as midwives this is what we do every day we are passionate about the ladies that are giving birth and giving birth um in a calm and safe and protective way and this is just from four of our ladies. And there are many more out there who can just show that actually, even in a time of crisis that we are all going through and such unknown, that they are still the absolute priorities of our service. And um, very proud to be midwives looking after them in, in all sorts of situations. And that the emotion that comes through from the midwives thing and the donations that we're getting, of, we're getting very well fed. I don't know if the other units have <laughs> seen that, how well fed the staff are being. And with the donations but yeah so uh, um in times of crisis there's massive positive um and i hope some of our services don't revert to what they were before i think that's everything from me that's well it's it's not everything Abby. it's a it's a sort of snapshot and i think what i'm picking up is the words i'm picking up are things like the, the increased home normal home birth rate joy breastfeeding, friendships being made by women, and you kind of think it would be good to kind of retain some of these things after this the crisis is passed, and I hope we're able to do that. And I'm just going to make a quick shout out, firstly, to welcome um, our Kate Morse is coming in, who's a maternity continuity lead, and she works with Sarah. So she's joining us for the questions and answers and I'm just doing a quick shout out for Matflix um, because that's a really important resource for midwives, student midwives and people who are using um, maternity services uh, and there's lots of materials there as well as materials through the practicing midwife resources and the all four maternity resources and forums for everyone. There's a lot of resources that you can use not just for the knowledge that you need but also looking after yourself at this sort of time because that is really important so without further ado i've had little questions pinging on my mobile here i'm not usually allowed to have a mobile phone when i'm doing chairing but for these conferences or these little sessions it's allowed and i've got the first question uh i've got is from uh, Lena Duncan, who says, I know of a woman booked in a London hospital with no birth centre or home birth option. A neighbouring hospital has reopened its home birth, but is not taking self-referrals. Can women change their birth care to suit their primary birth choices? And if so, how? That's quite a simple question, ladies. Shall I throw that to Sarah, perhaps? Oh, sorry, just unmuting. Um, I think, you know, women can absolutely transfer their care, um, particularly to another birth centre. I think it is more complicated if they want to birth at home because a neighbouring unit wouldn't be able to come across um, boundary uh, to look after somebody out of area. So the home birth service would be would need to be available at their local um, provider. But certainly they could choose to switch provider and go and birth in the birth centre. Okay. Can, can um, Kate or Abigail see any problems? 
No, that would be the same. That would be the same for us. Um, we would, uh, the ladies then just ask for a transfer. It would be the same as in the home birth within where they're living would need to be running because it would be that, that health board's midwives that came, but it would be the same. Fabulous. That's a good place to start. Okay, the second question is from Annabelle Bryant, and she is asking, have you got many midwives on a 12-week isolation? And I suspect that question will go to, well, maybe Sarah and Abby, or Sarah and Kate, who, which, who would like to choose. How about Sarah first? Kate, do you want to do, do just or Kate? Kate. Join in. Our, we haven't actually. Our overall, um, uh, in fact, I can tell you exactly. Let me just get my book from this morning. Um, we've only got uh, Sarah. Yeah, go on, Kate, go on. Yeah, we've got six that are on 12 weeks self isolating at the moment. That's all. Okay. Yeah. So it's about 3.8%. It's very low. Okay, that's positive. How about Abby? Yeah, we have we have some not 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 huge numbers though, but yeah, we do have some. Okay, oh, that's great. Okay, we've also um, being able to allocate work for the girls to be able to do virtually, so they are still contributing. So we've got midwives doing virtual bookings as part of the community workload. Oh, out in, within our clinic, we've got our out of area midwives still doing processing all the referrals from home we've been really well supported by the trust for people to have um access from home and one of our midwives is doing birth listening sessions virtually oh, with wow. women and so we have tried to continue with as many services using our okay. self-isolating midwives as much as possible that we can kate that's really useful because last year last week's session focused quite a bit on the guilt that some of these midwives might have not being able to be in the service and actually that illustrates yeah. they can be supporting the whole system and they've been amazing we needed them we need them to help support us it's been fabulous great that's smashing that's great very positive okay and now i have georgina keeney saying how has the community midwives responded to the increase in home births and i think that would have to go to all three of you in turn i could start with kate and then move to abby um, it probably initially we had some an anxiety as to the increasing workload because it coincided with the RCOG um, giving out the guidelines for antenatal care, which meant a complete change of the way we were working. Our children's centres closed. So I had a lot for my team to um, have to cope with a big change all at the same time. So we did lots of training with the girls, did some upskilling on skills drills, neonatal resuscitation. We did some home birth planning, home birth assessments and did videos, uploaded them onto their Facebook page that the midwives have and listening to how they're talking in the last couple of weeks about the births they've attended. It's been fabulous and I'm sure Sarah would agree with that. How, yeah, I can't, I'm so proud of them. I think Great. it's been amazing, actually, just how well all of the staff, you know, we've all had so many changes on a daily basis and, you know, everybody has just embraced it and particularly around the home birth because we sort of got everybody together, didn't we, virtually on the phone, had this phone call. I think there was a little bit of trepidation as to what was coming and uh, sort of said, you know, this this is the plan. This is a business continuity plan. You know, this is, you know, this, this is, you know, what we're going to be promoting. We're going to continue offering all three service but actively promote home birth. There was a little bit of a silence, Kate, wasn't there? <laughs> a little pause for a couple of seconds. Um, and then I can't remember what somebody said, but it made everybody laugh. But, um, yeah, I, I think it has been, you know, embraced. And I, I'm just so proud. I, I think we're just amazing, aren't we, as women? You know, we're very brilliant. And I think, you know, at the heart of everything we do, you know, we want to keep, you know, families at the centre. And, uh, you know, the midwives have been fantastic. And I think the enthusiasm is growing day by day, you know, with the positivity of the births that they're attending and the stories that they're telling, um, which is really lovely to hear. Mm. And they're getting that reinforcement, you know, through all the positivity that, you know, we're getting back from families just saying, you know, amazing the experience has been. Yeah. How about Abby? 
Yeah, we, um, we, it's kind of the same. We, there was some anxieties to start with, and I think that a number of um, the community, community teams initially felt that there was so, so much focus on the hospital services mm. and what was going to be available, you know, PPE and those kind of things. And with the guidance changing constantly, there was some anxieties around home births. And a number of, uh, to start with, a number of our neighbouring health boards did withdraw their home birth services. Um, so we spent a lot of time working with our community midwives. We put some extra procedures in place, and we we tried to work in you know in partnership with the community midwives and the and the and the women to get a really good system in place for them, so that, that everyone felt comfortable with. Because it's really important mm-hmm. to make sure that everyone's feeling safe and protected. Because obviously our staff are, are really important mm-hmm. to us. Um, but one of the things that we're seeing as well is that. that everything that we see the women post about their positive stories in the all wells group i contact all of those ladies and say please let me share your comments with the staff and share those comments with them for them to be able to see that the positivity that's coming from it um and it's not often you don't meet the community midwife come you know coming in with a placenta or something can say oh just have the most wonderful home birth and <laughs> it is just that in it's just it's one of the best birthing places to be isn't it that we yeah. we love as midwives so I think sometimes the anxiety of the unknown um, kind of was leading the way. And then once we kind of we dealt, dealt with that and made sure that we had the right processes in place mm. to support them, but everyone's beginning to really embrace it now. Fantastic. I hope we can retain some of this. Absolutely. I think we will. I think we will. Okay. I've got uh, a, que- a question from Denise Armstrong Lils or Lilles which and she's saying which virtual platform do you use co- for contacting your patients i'm assuming it's facebook isn't it well um if it's for a sky a, a conversation like a virtual appointment we use an app called talk anywhere which um it's started with the gp services it's not it's not bespoke to wales or anything it's an nhs service but um it's really very good because what happens is I have my, for my clinic, I have my clinic list. At, I send the lady a text message to say, I'm ready to start your consultation. And within the consultation is a, a link. She clicks on the link and I'm sat there waiting for her. So, um, and that can be used across any device and it's oh, secure. Right. Okay. So, um, and then we, we write up then the consultation and attach it to the patient's electronic record. So it works really well. Fab. And the same for Sarah and Kate? No, that sounds amazing. I'm, I'm thinking I really want to look into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, our okay. just would recommend that we use um, Zoom, but I don't think we've really moved that way because, like Sarah said, we telephone, we text, we're communicating with the Facebook, yeah. but the virtual, we need to explore some more. Yeah. Really. I love well, it. NHS Digital are looking at it. We've had some information in the last week around a system called attend um so i think there are is it the nhs digital are looking at sort of enabling people to do clinics virtually yeah so we're looking into that because it's kind of nice it's not it's like us sitting here meeting mm. together it's a face-to-face we as midwives like to talk mm. and the women like to talk too is a part of it of course okay next question i've got Letitia Epard Serrano, and she says, what are decisions that your midwives are making in their personal lives to keep their families safe? Are their midwives staying in other homes or hotels so as not to be a risk to their families? I think there's been some cases in the press recently. I can understand the question. But do you have any midwives who've left their families? Where any of the middle? I know um, a few of our medical colleagues have have so that they could maintain stay on their rotors have moved out temporarily of their family homes, but I'm not aware of any of our midwives okay. have done anything like that yet. Kate and Sarah, we yes, we have had the midwives move out to stay um, in alternative accommodation rather than than go home because they either live with vulnerable family members, yeah, so, which is quite tough. You know, yeah, they're missing yeah. home and they want to go home. So that's for a whole set of time. It's not just for a couple of days, is it? No, yeah. One of our midwives yeah. hasn't gone back home yet. Yeah, but is Gosh. considering it soon. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite heavy. Okay. 
And then I've got a question from Georgina Keeney who says, do you think some midwives are a little bit scared of home birth? I think you've answered that one <laughs> by, by the issue of uh, getting the skills and the drills and the discussion going. So I think that's been taken care of. Um, top fan Susan Vining asks, are any of the trusts utilising independent midwives to help with the workload? Do you have any independent midwives in your area? We don't have any in Wales. Oh, okay. So we, we aren't. So, so we do. We've had a couple that are applying, just going through the sort of um, bank contract process at the moment. So absolutely welcome any independent midwife you know, that would like to join the bank. Fabulous. Okay. And, oh, I've got a, an additional question from Leticia Eckard Serrano, who was asking the question about midwives moving out of their home. It's an addition to the previous question. Um, she's asked, she's from... Now, I won't be able to pronounce this, from Oaxaca in Mexico, where we're just getting ready for the expected outbreak. We want to learn from you all. Welcome, Leticia. So that's why she's wanting to ask. Mm -hmm. I think uh, hopefully you'll find this information very helpful, Leticia. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I wondered, I was wondering about the sort of, it's it's been a lot of work, and you've you've got your a lot of positive um, things in your services. And I was wondering what you feel the senior staff need, as well as you know, like like your good selves. Are there things that you feel you need additionally at the moment? It's just working well as a as a strong team, and um, everyone coming together. We in when. Um, Things were, were initially starting, we would have a COVID huddle, which is the wrong word because you weren't meant to huddle at all. You had to social distance. Um, but and we met every day at 12 o'clock to make sure that everyone knew exactly where we were for that day because every, guidance was changing so rapidly. It was very hard. By the time something came out and you filtered it out to the staff, the next version was coming out. So it, that all got a little bit overwhelming. And I found, I think, in those initial weeks, we would all go through stages of feeling overwhelmed on depending on which area of the service that you were concentrating on. So I think it was just the support of each other and making sure that we were visual for for the rest of the teams, but just being able to have that moment of going to say, I'm not sure what's happening now. I've lost track of where we are. But that's, and seeing as I've really, really enjoyed us all working so closely together all the different specialties really coming together because it's not I know it it is a crisis situation but you're usually in a room when you're discussing something that's not great and just to be talking about how are we going to run the service on a daily basis with the obstetrician getting you know on first name basis is now with obstetricians and anesthetists, pediatricians clinical board directors directors of nursing it's been a really nice opportunity if we can pick some positives out of it. I think there's a lot of positives. <laughs> How about Sarah or Kate? Was there anything that you felt that you needed additionally? I think the teamwork sounds fantastic. I think we did very similar to Abby. We looked at, um, it, we had exactly the same of everything changing and within minutes of you trying to get your head around it, it was changing. We all know the PPE changes probably daily and that was that was hard. Um, but we extended our management cover to a seven day service and we changed our shift patterns to work longer days so that we were there to support the staff for longer. But it also meant that we worked in blocks. So we would do three on three off. So that we actually got some time to step away ourselves. And I think that was really, really important for us as a senior team. And we're now at a period of stability and so we're reverting back to our um, normal working pattern but I think that was massive for us to be able to do that for our our own well-being as well and being visible for the teams at different times of day and for the night teams as well. Fantastic I have to say I, I could have a speaking for hours but I know the, the clock is against us at the moment and I, I have to bring the discussion to a conclusion. And I know people will be asking more questions and we will try and answer some of those questions afterwards. 
Um, I hope people have enjoyed coming to the, the um, session. Thank you so much to our Head of Midwifery, Sarah Noble, and our, our, I want to say community midwife, <laughs> our consultant midwife, Abby Holmes, and our continuity lead, Kate Morse. Thank you so much for the discussion. It's been fantastic. And I hope that we could, that the viewers can take a lot of the positive things away and the work, because it sounds very positive, but you've put so much work into your services. And it sounds so like the women and babies and families are so beautifully supported. Also, please note that there will be resources available on the website and just a word to say, say, say well and look after yourselves and your families and tell them you love them. This is the time. Thank you. The Maternity and Midwifery Forum brings you Netflix, video streaming from maternity experts. All your CPD and revalidation needs met in one place. Our expertly curated box sets are the perfect way to engage with the latest thinking, issue by issue. They make revalidation easy and are the perfect accompaniment to any project or university coursework. In addition to video from expert speakers across maternity and midwifery, there is easily accessible research and links to the latest government policy documents. Our reflective questions at the end are the perfect primer for your revalidation. In the same way the Maternity and Midwifery Forum provides certificates to show that you have attended these festivals, we can provide certificates for those who have consumed the content of a box set and submitted their written answers to the reflective questions provided by our curator, Dr Jenny Hall. Midwives, maternity professionals and students, do not miss out. Subscribe to Matflix today. Box sets are £17.50 each, or access to them all starts at £6.99 per month. Students pay just £2.99 a month. Check out the box sets and subscribe today at www.matflix.co.uk.